Thank you, Leila. You're too humble as well, I have to say. Okay, we are going to talk about embeddings a lot today. Uh, obviously, that's an important element of retrieval. And so this is what we are going to cover. First, what really are embeddings? I don't know if there is anyone that doesn't know about embeddings yet. Maybe raise your hands so I can have an idea. Okay, just a few hands. Okay, okay. So that will be very interesting for you. Then we'll think about how we got here. How did we arrive at the point where embeddings are becoming so important for the AI and data science community? Uh, then we'll have a path between embeddings and search. Then later on, we'll talk about more intelligent applications, uh, RAGs, recommendation system, and uh, advanced search. Okay, what are the embeddings? Really, the embeddings are vectors. So they are mathematical vectors that can be used in machine learning or deep learning models. Uh, they can encode, and by that I mean they can represent some text, some images, some video, some audio into a dense vector of lower dimensions. So if you think about, for example, text, if you take the English language, you would have literally millions of words. And so if you wanted to encode this and you used uh, a, a naive approach, your vectors would be immensely large. And what you want to do is to reduce the dimensionality of your vectors so that you can do some efficient computation on them. So if you look at this sentence there, friends, women, countrymen, lend me your ears, you can transform that with an embedding models into this sequence of mathematical vectors. So who knows where that sentence is coming from? There is a bonus pizza if you know the answer. Shakespeare? You got it. Shakespeare. So this is what a lot of people use ChatGPT for. They have a query, they don't know the answer, and they query ChatGPT to have an answer. And this is what's happening inside ChatGPT. You start with your query, for example, where is that sentence coming from? Then you send this to a tokenizer. A tokenizer is effectively a utility that will transform those words and this sentence into a series of words. And those words will be separated so that they can be encoded into a vocabulary. And so when you look at the first vectors that you have there, each number here represents a word. So 101 is a classical one because what it represents is effectively the beginning of the sentence. And 102 at the end always represents the end of the sentence. Then once uh, those vectors are tokenized, this vector will be passed to the model. And so your model could be Llama 2, it could be ChatGPT, it could be Mistral, Orca, whichever you want. And the output of this process will also produce a series of vectors. And so that's what you see there. Again, you see our 101, start of the sentence, then our 102 at the end, meaning the end of the sentence. And the tokens is the translation from those index numbers to the real world that we are looking for. And at the end, you can effectively see the answer to your query, in that case, indeed, Act 3, Send 2 of Julius Caesar. So one thing that is surprising for some people is that ChatGPT actually never sees any text. We're surprised by that. You send text to ChatGPT, but the only thing that ChatGPT will see is a sequence of vectors. And so there is one more uh, um, element happening that I didn't talk about, is that those index, so one index per word in your vocabulary, will be transformed into those dense vectors. And that's what the embedding layer in a model or in a tokenizer will do for you. It will transform every single word into a sequence of dense vectors, and that's what the model will use as an input. 
So, in fact, distributed representation have really come a long way because at the very beginning, everyone was were using term document matrix. And we'll see an example of that later on. A term document matrix is effectively a sparse vector where you have one entry for each word of the vocabulary. We also, uh, embeddings were also used for the next fleet prize. I don't know if uh, you, you remember this, but there were there was a one million pound or one million dollar prize for someone who, were, who was able to predict rating on Netflix movies. And this led to another type of embedding. Later on, we had word to vec Glove and FastText, which were static embeddings that became very popular in the 2015 to 2017. And then from 2017, you had the era really of transformers, uh, which ChatGPT and Llama and Co are still based on. Okay, so this really summarizes the different type of embeddings that you can have. You can have embeddings that are based on deep learning models, like Glove, BERT. Uh, you have embeddings that are uh, really created for images, even though they are still now inspired by transformers like uh, CLIP, uh, VIT, and so on. And you can also embed video or sound. So that's on the deep learning side. In the graph uh, 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 column, you have collaborative filtering. So the Netflix prize was somewhat one implementation of this, but also from a mathematical point of view, it was a matrix factorization. So what matrix factorization means will we'll see in a minute, but effectively it's decomposing uh, a matrix of rating, people rating movies into one matrix of movies and one matrix of items like the movies. Like one matrix of users and one matrix of items. Then you have some embeddings that you can create with graph method like uh, PPR and PR, meaning page rank and personalized page rank. And Emerging as a field is a graph representation for causal learning, which we'll hear about in the second talk. On the topology side, you have two methods that are really popular. You have TSNE, and then you have UMAP, which are methods who are really based on also building graph, but looking at local distance or local uh, neighborhood of graph or global neighborhood of graph. So UMAP is the most recent one and probably is the best one to use at the moment because it can allow you to embed data in a much faster way than what you can do with TSNE, look, look, using really uh, a local neighborhood and global neighborhoods. And so those uh, topology-based methods are really good for visualization. So here, what you can see are effectively the same uh, data set embedded with both UMAP and TSNE. And you can see that the, color, the colors are clustered uh, uh, correctly, relatively correctly, especially on the UMAP side. So you could have some data that you want to understand. Use UMAP to embed the sentences, to embed the description, and then visualize the output of it with uh, UMAP or TSNE. But you can also reuse uh, uh, those embeddings to predict other things if you want. Okay, let's go a little bit deeper. So I talk about term document matrix initially. I don't know if anyone is still using this, but this is what this used to look like. So you would have a series of documents. So in that case, you have 12 documents. And in each document, you effectively count the number of words that appear in each, each one of them. And so you could use this to do things like clustering of, of, of data. You could use this to do classification also to try to understand what topic is being talked about. And that was very popular, I would say, before deep learning. Possibly this is still being used but I guess this is a bit dated at this point. 
the problem with this approach is, as I mentioned before, the size of your vocabulary, because you have as many columns in your matrix as you have words. So again, think about a company having users. If you have 3 million users, you, you need a matrix of that, of that size. And, and so if you have a lot of users plus a lot of items, it's very difficult to deal with. That being said, it can be improved a little bit by using latent semantic indexing. And if, effectively, this is coming back to uh, a matrix decomposition methods, trying to create a matrix on which you can compute with a little bit less entries. OK, so that was the uh, 1 million Netflix prize. The graph on the right, I think, is, is, is really useful because it shows you how the matrix decomposition approach uh, worked. So if you look at the particular color on that matrix, you can see that the matrix decomposition is recomputing the matrix for the users and for the movies. And so if you want to know what a user would have rated uh, uh, a particular movie, you can just use your matrix of users and multiply it by the matrix of movies by picking up the right index for the user and the right index for the movie. And then you will get a best guess in terms of what that user would have rated that movie. Then you can decide if you want to recommend that movie to that particular user. Obviously, what you're trying to do is not only to predict uh, uh, the rating from the users, but also to maximize your views or, or the satisfaction of the user. So again, there is a computational cost, particularly in terms of updates. Let's say you improving or you enlarging every day or every year the size of your data set, both in terms of users and in terms of, in term of uh, products. That's something that can be a bit painful. On the tech side, uh, an important moment was word to vec I remember when this really came out, many people, I wouldn't say were afraid, like some people have been afraid of ChatGPT, but they were puzzled. The reason is that was the first method that really allowed you to do logic on words and logic on words representation. And so that's the example you see at the bottom right here. Uh, this uh, paper proved that you could do analogies with mathematical representation. And in that case, what you see there is that if you remove the vector representing man from the vector representing a king and you add a vector representing a woman, then in your index of embeddings, you get extremely close to the vector representing queen, which means that in practice, you can give analogies to that model and retrieve answers that you can just look up in the embedding matrix. On the computer vision side, what became popular uh, was the use of what we called backbone uh, computer vision model. And effectively, what that means is that models that were build, built on um, traditional CNN could be reused uh, with all the data. So in practice, what you would do is you would create a model, for example, that is doing some classification. Let's say in that case, classification of cat versus dog. While you're training the model, the model itself is learning a lot of different level of representation of the data that can then be useful, for example, to recognize or to classify clothes, which have nothing to do with cats. And so what you would do is you would build that model, then remove the classifier at the very end of that model, so that's in, uh, uh, after the green part here, and reuse all the layers until the classifier in order to do prediction on another model. But also, you can reuse that model to just create embeddings for those images. And then those embeddings can be used inside a larger system to do search or to do recommendation. 
Okay, then came the Transformers, 2017. Uh, the paper, Attention is All You Need, was published. Then the next year, there was a BERT paper that made a lot of uh, noise. And in 2020, you had the GPT-3 paper, and well, no, the GPT-3 product, let me say, instead, and that was effectively the beginning of what became ChatGPT. And so the way this works is that you see on the left here, you give some, you create a language model, but that language model is a transformer. And in the GPT case, what you're trying to predict every time is the next word. So you give it four words, you try to predict the fifth. You give it six, you six words, you try to pre predict the seventh, which is a bit different from the original architecture, really, and also a bit different from the BERT uh, uh, line of work, and we'll see the differences uh, a bit later. But while you're predicting the next word, you update the representation of your word, and so you progressively learn a good representation for each word. And so this is what you get in that case, let's say that you create an embeddings or a vector embeddings for each word that is of dimension eight. Progressively, for example, the word banking will become closer and closer to the word interest rate, and it will get further and further, for example, from the, for the word from the word bottle, because they have no meaning. And so that's what you see in the graph in the middle there. Progressively, those embeddings start to make semantic sense. And in the case of the transformers, one uh, a tool that is used to do that is the attention. So effectively, the world doesn't just pay attention to the previous, uh, just the previous world immediately in front of it. It will possibly uh, uh, take into account all the words that came before, but weight them in order of importance. Okay, and so those are the three, let's say, descendants of the original paper of attention is all you need. On the left, you have a BERT. So BERT was an encoder model. In the middle, you have T5, which is a model that is the closest to the original paper where you have both an encoder that will try to give you a very good representation of uh, the sentence and a decoder that will try to predict the next word or what's coming up next. And on the right, you have GPT, which is the family from which uh, Yama2 and ChatGPT are coming from. And all of these models have actually uh, generated new forms of embeddings and what's happening right now is that embeddings is becoming really a competitive sport. So every week you have people publishing some new models, but also some new embeddings models uh, that are trying to maximize uh, the accuracy or the performance on a set of metrics like clustering, classification, pair classification, or re-ranking. And this is changing very fast. So what you see there, I think, was taken last week. So last week, the first model was a model called BG, BGE Large. That was, I think it was created by Tencent, but it was basically a multilingual model uh, that included Chinese. But I checked yesterday, and the order had already changed. Now the best model is a model by Koeri uh, Startup, uh, that is called Embed V3. Another thing that is interesting to see in this ranking is that the best accessible embeddings from ChatGPT or from OpenAI was ranking number 15 because the embeddings of uh, GPT-4, which is the best model from OpenAI, uh, were not accessible. So I don't know if they announced this yesterday, but until yesterday, they didn't give you access to the embeddings, which for me is really telling because if it was not of great value, I suspect we would have access to it. So I don't know if some people might be able to reverse engineer some of what is inside ChatGPT with the embeddings, but the fact is, even as an enterprise user, this is not available yet. 
So the same movement that we saw in text with the transformers, effectively replacing a lot of the traditional NLP, we've also seen with images. And so we moved from traditional convolutional neural networks to image embeddings, which uh, are built on top of transformers as well. And so what you see on this image from the original, from the or original paper is that they transform an image in a sequence, exactly like we use sequence for text. So what they do is they split are the image in different patches and unwall those patches, then embed those patches with a linear layer and pass uh, this through the model. And at the end, you get uh, a class, if that's what you're trying to predict. And in doing so, in training a model like this, you, you're going to learn better and better embeddings. And as I mentioned before, those embeddings are reusable and uh, can be deployed for another, another application. What's interesting also here is that the actual arch architecture of the transformer is very close from the one uh, that we've seen with text. Then there was this clip moment, uh, which clip is effectively a paper that was published by, by OpenAI. <laughs> Uh, I have the reference later on. I think that was in 2021. But this was following work from a, a lot of people, but among others, Carl Party that was at Stanford before going to Tesla. And what it is doing is co-learning both a text representation to build embeddings and an image representation. So instead of learning them separately, what you would do is you give a model an image and then you give it also a text description. And when the image and the text description are matching, you give a positive feedback so that the model can learn that the text was actually describing the image. And so what you will do is give both positive and negative example so that progressively the, the embeddings of both the text side and the image side can align together. And so they can live in the same vector space to some extent. And in terms of the, the encoder on the image side, they were building on what the VIT, so the vision transformer, had done. On the graph side, you also have now, and for the last three years, there were a lot of papers on GNN, so graph neural network, and so on. And so you have embeddings for graphs, not only for particular nodes in the graph, but also for some subgraph, and even for the graph itself, where you need to define effectively what is your similar similarity in terms of two nodes being close one from each other, or two graphs being close one from each other. And same thing, you learn this by training, giving uh, 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 more and more example of graphs or training on a large graph going across all those nodes. And so that can be used once you have those representation, for example, of nodes. You can do things like community detection, you can do node detection, influence maximization, and so on. And also link and add prediction is a good use case because that's something you can use to do recommendation. Okay, let's talk now about actual search and vector search and what I call the old world and the new world. So in the old world, everyone had something built on top of Lucene. I don't know if anyone knows about Lucene here. Okay, a few, a few people. So uh, Lucene, like Elasticsearch and Sol R, are really tools to do originally keyword search. And so you can use them with your website in order to get some answers to the query from the users. And what they do uh, generally are using those traditional techniques like TFIDF, so term frequency, inverse document frequency, 
that looks at the statistics of the documents and the text in order to retrieve uh, uh, a document when you make a sentence. So what they will do, for example, is find uh, a, a representation of the number of times you have the word banking or interest rate. Then when you make a query that includes some of those words, the documents that are closer to your query will be retrieved. But what they mean by close in this sense is really uh, around keyword closeness as opposed to semantic closeness. So for example, if you make a query with bank, uh, you could have documents coming about the river bank as opposed to uh, uh, a banking institution. And that's what vector search allows you to evade to some extent, because in vector search, the meaning of the sentence is represented by the embeddings. And so when you make a query, instead of just trying to match a particular uh, series of characters, it will try to find similarities in the meaning of the documents. And that's uh, what is allowed by um, those embeddings models and the tools that have been built for them, like vector databases and so on. And we'll talk about this. And so, in terms of identifying similarity, the most used metrics uh, for this is uh, cosine similarity, that effectively is if your embeddings are normalized, will be extremely fast. So that's another advantage of vector search. The first one is that you search in the semantic space, not in the keyword space. And the second one is that it can be incredibly fast. And so the example you see there is that you have four sentences, three of them that are relatively similar, and a fourth one that is completely different. And when you compute the co cosine similarity, you see immediately that the fourth document is not a good match for the particular query that you had in the, in the beginning. So in that case, your query would be, this is a happy person, and you look for, uh, uh, let's say, two other close uh, uh, documents, and you won't retrieve today is a sunny day because it's too far in cosine similarity. So why is AI moving to vector database bases? There, is, there are really two types of reasons. The first one is around the ecosystem in the data science and AI space, and the other reason is in terms of functionality. In terms of the ecosystem, you have more and more transformers, and transformers are literally built on top of embeddings. And so you need the tools to manipulate, to retrieve, to calculate with embeddings, and natural uh, uh, search engines or natural databases are not really great at text retrieval or text analysis or text search, whereas vector databases are much better at this. Um, and also, if you think about what I mentioned about Clip, Clip allows you to embed in the same vector space both images and text. And that's something you see since really the era of big data. We want to analyze more and more non-traditional data, non-CSV based or non-Excel based data. And so those vector search can also allow you to efficiently retrieve and analyze data that is of another modality than the traditional tabular data that we use. From a functionality point of view, it also, not only does it allow you to move from keyword to semantics, but it's also really good at, uh, let's say, being a component in your fight against hallucination. Because you probably know already, but the biggest danger of those new large LLM like ChatGPT or BARD or uh, Corey's model uh, or Claude is that sometimes they just make stuff up. There is no other way to put it. And the reason why they make stuff up is because at training stage, they see a lot of data. And that data is by default their source of information. So while they are getting trained, they learn very useful things like, uh, uh, let's say, 
uh, talking very well, reading very well, producing content that is logical and that makes sense from a user's perspective, but they also learn things that are completely wrong. And sometimes when you query them, they send you back an answer uh, because they, let me not say they think, but they are trained to always send back a user, uh, uh, an answer. They are rarely trained to tell you, I don't know. And so when they don't have the data, they will make up data that sounds really good. I had a friend, for example, last week that told me that he got afraid because he was doing a, a query on one of those engines and the answer he got looked perfect and it was a quote except that that quote never existed. So he, he went to the book, he opened up the page, he opened up the chapter, and that quote didn't exist. But it sounded perfectly uh, like the author. It was just made up from scratch. And so having those vector database where you can effectively add some of your knowledge is very useful to control those hallucination. And so because of this, the field of uh, vector search and vector databases has really grown extremely fast in the last few years. So you can see on the top left hand side a few companies that are building really native vector search. One thing I, I forgot to mention there, but that is actually uh, pretty important in that space is a uh, library by Facebook called Face that is uh, quite efficient at doing very quick uh, vector retrieval. But what you see in the bottom is that, on the bottom right, is that companies that were not in the vector business at all are now creating or manipulating their original positioning to include vector search inside their system, which is a good sign that the industry itself is moving very quickly toward vector search. Uh, but I can't really estimate how good they have become without changing uh, their original system. And so we'll see, it's very likely that some of those startups will just be bought later on by some of the most established players, but at the moment, uh, things are still in flux. How do you train some of those embeddings? There are some tools that are very useful to do that, like Sentence Bird uh, that was created in 2019. And you see an illustration of how those models are trained here. You have something that is called a Siamese net network, where effectively you have two versions of the same network that you feed sentences to. And then you try to uh, calculate a difference between the two uh, after passing the model through the network. In that case, that's a BERT-based network. And some of the top-ranked embeddings that I showed you uh, earlier in the, in the leaderboard are still based on those BERT-based methods. They haven't moved, and that's an interesting question why, actually. They haven't moved yet to GPT-based uh, uh, models. And so you have a softmax classifier that uh, you feed different representation of both sentences, but also the difference, the absolute difference between them. And later on, when you do inference and you want to find a representation of one of those sentences, basically you remove uh, uh, the softmax classifier and you just uh, uh, calculate a, a cosine similarity, like I mentioned before, then you will have an idea of whether those sentences are close or not. Okay, going from basic search to more intelligent applications requires, like I mentioned, those vector database. That's yet another database on the market. Uh, this one that is giving an example of how those vector databases are actually used. So you have an application and you have source data. You feed uh, information 
from the source data to an embedding model. And each document of information that you pass to the embedding model will be transformed into a vector and stored into the vector database. Then when a query uh, uh, is coming, you will have a similarity search between that new query and the documents that you already have in your vector database in order to retrieve the closest or the more accurate uh, uh, match for your query. And so if you think about traditional relational databases, there are a few differences. So instead of having a table, you really have a vector space. And one thing that is interesting to think about is how do you do if your embedding model has changed? I'm not sure the industry has fully answered that question yet, but if you have an idea, do let me know. Another thing that is different is that updates are a bit difficult, and you could link this to what I've just uh, said, but also once you have a vector embedded, if you update that document, effectively you will have a new embedding in your vector database. The previous one won't necessarily disappear. So that's something to consider. Because with embeddings, everything is in terms of similarity and is in the vector space. So you will never find exactly the same vector. What you will find is a nearby vector inside your vector space. So updates are difficult because of this. And join don't exist. But that was already the case with traditional NoSQL systems. OK, and this really illustrates a problem that is bigger than just the one of, uh, of a vector database, which is the fact that in vector space and in machine learning, often you are in the probabilistic space. You're not in, the, in, in a place where you have exact queries and tractable information. So for example, if you have a table, you know exactly what query you will push to that table and you know exactly what answer you will get. In the vector space, a lot of things are probabilistic and also are approximate, which make it more powerful for some application and less powerful for others. So it depends on really the application that you have. Uh, and one reason I forgot to mention, one reason why you have approximation is that often in the new LLM world, your query won't be code, it will be language. And so two people who are querying an SQL database, most of the time will write exactly the same query. But two people who are querying a language model, most of the time will send some completely different uh, uh, query to the model. And that's one reason why one is deterministic, the other one is more probabilistic. Okay, and so this is the current solution of the industry, really, in terms of controlling hallucination, controlling those approximations that are built in, into the new LLM world, which is called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Uh, this actually is not new. Uh, the paper, uh, the two papers that really have created this uh, new model were published, I think, in 2020 and 2021, one from Google, one from Facebook. Uh, but what's happening here and what the industry is doing is much simpler than what we had in that paper. So you have documents. Again, you embed them. Those documents are then stored into one of those vector databases. But then when you have a query, instead of retrieving directly the document who are closer to this query from the database, what you will do is you will do the query to the database, retrieve some documents, and then pass all those documents to a language model. And then the language model, with its own ability to write, ability to understand content, to understand sentences, and to generate new content, will use this information as effectively a, a condition to produce the answer. And so that's one way you, you can try to force the model to retrieve the right answer or to retrieve a logical answer to you is by giving it this context 
contextual information just before it creates your answer. And that's what we call RAG. So that's an example uh, uh, on the right. You have a query. That query itself is embedded. Then you have different uh, documents that are already inside your vector database. And there will be a scoring between your query, basically a similarity scoring between your query and those documents. And the vector database will retrieve uh, 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 the, the exact text of those documents, then pass it to the language model, and in the end, the language model will compute an answer for you. So now I have a, a few slides about what people are currently doing using embeddings. The first slide I have is around YouTube. So originally, I think that was in 2019 or 2018, I can't quite remember, this paper uh, called Wide and Deep Learning for Recommender System was published. And one of the main ideas really was to combine deep learning representation, so embedding created uh, uh, from, from neural network, combine them with uh, other non-categorical data. So effectively combine them with variable like age, like uh, uh, gender in that case, and, and so on. So effectively you take some information that is categorical, uh, let's say, in that case, you could have, for example, a product. So you have, let's say, 10,000 products in your database. For YouTube, that would be a particular movie. You will embed this information, but then take information from the user that, are, uh, that is uh, numerical, and then join both of those type of data inside a layer, then pass this through the network in order to make a prediction about what that person is going to watch. And this approach was then adopted in many other firms. Something a bit simpler on that slide is the stitch fix approach. So this is the same idea of matrix factorization on the left. Uh, what you see is you had, uh, so I don't know if you know Stitch Fix, but Stitch Fix is a company that just send you things at home and you decide what you want to keep and what you want to return. And so what they, they observe really is your taste by generating packages that you have to return or keep. And so while they do this, they learn both a representation of your taste, so that's the first matrix on the, on the left, and a representation of their own items. And later on, those representations, those embeddings can be used into more advanced model uh, that could be deep learning model. And some of them will be deep learning models that like the one we just saw with YouTube. Another uh, example of those embeddings being used is what LinkedIn is doing in order to predict what you're going to interact with, but also to present you content. And so what you see at the bottom are effectively the sources of the data to compute the embeddings. So you have two embeddings table, one for the members, so the people who are uh, using uh, LinkedIn, and another one for the, the post. And so one thing that is interesting here is they effectively aggregate some embeddings from users, but also from the, user, from the users that the user interact with. So if you talk a lot with one of your colleagues, for example, on LinkedIn, when they are making predictions for you, they will use not only your embedding, but his embeddings as well. And also, the embeddings of the content that he reads. And so this is propagated, and at the end you see you have a, 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 a fully connected layer that will integrate all those embeddings in order to make prediction about what you will like, what you will share, what you will comment, and, and so that will effectively determine what uh, content you will see in your feed. So all of this 
leads us to three phases of modern AI systems. First, you have comp comp computation of embeddings for users, for items, for queries. Then you have a retrieval phase. So based on those embeddings, a number of documents or recommendation uh, 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 will be pushed as candidates. And then those candidates will be filtered and re-ranked. And I didn't show that with SBIRT, the sentence BERT that we talk about, but there is the same process with text as well. You have embedding, retrieval, then filtering and ranking, and re-ranking. For example, in terms of re-ranking, this is uh, an example from NVIDIA. In terms of re-ranking and filtering, uh, what will happen, for example, is that you have business logic that will push you to filter some things out. So if you YouTube, for example, there are some content you don't want to show to kids. So even though uh, the algorithm might produce a very high level of recommendation for this item because it's very popular, the filtering will remove it from that person's feed. But you will have other uh, uh, variables. For example, if someone has just bought this particular item or a very similar item, you might not want to recommend it again when you know that that person just uh, uh, bought that particular item. So that's for the filtering. And in the re-ranking uh, or the scoring and the, uh, the re-ranking, what you can do is also use both the candidates and the query and pass both of them together in, inside a new model so that uh, the, the fit between the query and uh, the, the, the product or the item can be higher than what the candidates have outputted. And so this is what the NVIDIA, uh, uh, this, this slide from NVIDIA is showing. You have inference, filtering, scoring, and ordering. And the ordering can also be based on financial information, for example. So if two items are, let's say, of similar likelihood to be picked up by the user, as an enterprise, you might want to uh, uh, put the one who has the highest margin for you higher than the other. So all of those different parts can actually be tweaked in order to maximize a business objective as well. So those are some of the references uh, for this talk. Uh, effectively, for me, the most important one, because that was the most shocking to me, was the very first one when people managed to show that you can do logic with word vectors. But obviously, some of the other ones are very relevant as well. So that's it. Thank you very much. You have our contact here if you have any questions or any queries about this subject. So maybe we'll take a few questions if anyone has some questions left.